In the 1970s and 80s, this um, phrase, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM, became a popular way of describing IT executives who continued to buy from IBM, even though there was potentially better and cheaper alternatives available. And the idea is that IBM was a perceived safe choice. And I think we can actually draw a parallel between what we see with this attitude towards IBM and the attitude towards serverless today, that it's somehow perceived as the unsafe choice. And that's despite the benefits of serverless being really clear and proven. You pay for what you use, it automatically provisions and scales, and it's highly available and secure. And there's potentially many reasons why people are reluctant to adopt serverless, but I think the main motivating factor comes down to fear. Fear of the cost, fear of the scaling, fear of the developer experience. And whenever I started my serverless journey, I felt comfortable with the underlying concepts of serverless. But what I was actually afraid of the most was choosing the correct database. Um, with serverless on AWS, I think the standout choice is DynamoDB. But DynamoDB has this concept of needing to know all of your access patterns up front. And as an engineer, you know that uh, requirements can change at, at any moment. And this concept of knowing your access patterns up front seemed like a huge risk. I'm an AWS community builder. Um, and one of the benefits of that program is that you have access to a lot of like-minded engineers. And I asked those engineers a question. When you first started your serverless journey, what were you afraid of? And how did you overcome it? And I feel like I got some really good answers. The first person said that they were afraid of getting up to speed with a serverless paradigm, that that was actually going to take a long time before they would see any benefits. But in actual fact, what happened was they built and deployed their Lambda function to production in just a few days, and that gave the team the confidence and the momentum to carry on their serverless journey. This person said that at an organizational level, they were worried that it wouldn't add any value to their systems and to their customers, that the education around serverless and distributed systems was actually going to be really difficult. But in actual fact, it was that education that proved to them that it does add value to those things. The next one was from early days, in, in relatively early days in serverless, 2016, 2017. And they were actually worried that it wasn't going to gain any market share, that they'd be stuck with, stuck with an architecture that had no community support and no developers would actually be able to work on it. And we know with the benefit of hindsight and proven by today that the serverless community is thriving and there's plenty of engineers who would love to work uh, with serverless. This one requires a special mention. After a super painful move off of Engine Yard and later OpsWorks, we were pretty anxious about packaging business logic as a zip file. And I don't know about you, but whenever I first read that one, I just felt the pain in that engineer's voice. Really, I think the respectful thing to do would be to hold a moment of silent reflection for what those engineers had to endure. But circling back to my own fear, the fear of knowing all of your access patterns up front, the solution to that one was simple. It was just education. I had to educate myself on how DynamoDB works and how to model your data correctly whenever you store it. I used the DynamoDB book by Alex Debris um, to do that, and it was a fantastic resource, and the, uh, myself and our team have really benefited from it. And I actually think that knowing all of your access patterns up front is actually a feature of DynamoDB rather than a bug. I think that it leads to much better architectures overall. Um, but still, like I said, we've been working on a serverless project for the past few years now. And one of the things that I think made our project a huge success is that we have a confident serverless team. We have a team that truly believes that serverless was the correct choice and who truly loves working with a serverless architecture. But we didn't start out that way. There was a long period of time where the team had their fears, they had their concerns, and they had their questions. And today we're going to look at how you can instill confidence in your serverless teams. And we're going to look at three things. How you can encourage a serverless mindset how you can enlighten developers that writing less code is actually better, and how you can enable production deployments with confidence. But before we get into these three things, let me introduce myself. My name's Matthew Wilson. I'm husband to Rebecca, father to Joy Tabitha, a principal software engineer at Instill, and an AWS community builder in the serverless category. Working on this project, I think it's been one of the best projects I've ever worked on. And the serverless nature of it is part of that, but even more important are my fantastic colleagues at Instill. And really without them, I would have nothing interesting to talk about today. So this talk is a huge thank you to all the hard work that they've put into the Stroll um, project over the past two years. So the project's called Stroll. Stroll's a local company here in Northern Ireland. They sell, they sell car insurance. You can go to strollinsurance.co.uk right now. 
and buy a car insurance policy. And from you typing your car registration all the way through to the end of that journey, that's fully serverless. So that makes it 10 times cooler. So I encourage you to go buy a policy right now. And the vision for Stroll is this. It's a digitally-led brokering business combining innovative technology with industry-leading expertise to deliver exceptional customer experiences. And what our responsibility was as Instil, as Instil was that innovative technology. It's a shiny new insurance platform built with managed services on AWS. And we're going to talk about some AWS things here today, but I hope that you know, regardless of your cloud provider, you'll find something useful from what we're going to talk about today. Um, we've been working on Stroll from the very beginning, like I said, and from the offset, the team decided that this was going to be a serverless project. I think one of the best things about our jobs is that you can start with an empty Git repository, and with the help of a lot of people, turn that into a business for someone. That's a feeling that never really gets old. But one thing I've learned on this project um, is that you can do it much better, much faster, and in a much more mature way by using serverless technologies. And one of the first things I think you need to do if you want to instill confidence in your serverless teams is to encourage a serverless mindset. But as my colleague would say, if you're not drinking the serverless Kool-Aid, you might not necessarily know if there's a serverless mindset at all, that there's a mindset to be had. And its origins lie in a blog post written by Ben Kehoe entitled, Serverless is a State of Mind. And in it, he lays out the fact that serverless isn't really about the underlying technology. It's not about Lambda functions. It's not about the managed services. Serverless is about focusing on delivering business value. And whenever you as an engineer focus on delivering business value, you'll tend to notice that serverless is the best fit to solve that problem. But I don't think that an individual can actually encourage a serverless mindset all on their own. I think it has to come from the top down. It needs to really start at an organizational level. And thankfully, working at Instill, that was the case. We have an engineering strategy. And in the cloud section, there's this point that we want to embrace serverless. But this requires a cultural change in how we approach building software. And you know, the culture at Instill is really around ex engineering excellence. And if you focus on serverless from a purely engineering perspective, I think that you can come up short on actually what the benefits are. Because if you selfishly look at it and ask yourself, is serverless easier to deploy? I would say it's no different than other options available. The, the tooling's so good now that really deploying to the cloud is, is trivial. Is it easier to test? I would say not really. Um, you really need to think differently about how you test serverless applications. Is it easier to code? Is it easier to develop? Um, maybe, but you first really need to educate yourself first on those things. So looking at it selfishly as an engineer, you might actually come up short on what the benefits of serverless are. And I know as a team, at the very start of this project, there was that kind of fear that had we made the right choice? And the reason why is because we were looking at it from a purely engineering perspective. And one of the first things we needed to do as a team was to enlighten developers that writing less code is better. Now, like I said, the culture at Instill is focused on engineering excellence, and that attracts people who love to write code. So whenever you tell those people that you should really write less code, um, you're going to meet some resistance. But what we're not saying is that you don't write any code at all. What we're saying is that the part of serverless is that you write the code that really matters, the code that's actually going to give your business some unique selling points in their marketplaces. And for me, um, this idea of writing the code that really matters, I, I had an experience of this sort of clicking in my head that this was how we should do this. And I need to tell you a story about how that came to be. So there I was working from home during a global pandemic. I was working on what you can see in the screen behind me, which is the customer portal for Stroll. And the task was really simple. I had to fetch some data from DynamoDB and return that to the client. But little did I know that my life was about to change forever. And to explain that life-changing moment, I first need to explain what our architecture looked like. So there's going to be some AWS logos on the screen here. I'll try and explain them as best as I can if you're not familiar with them. But the big pink box in the middle is AppSync. It's the managed GraphQL server on AWS. It's absolutely fantastic. You give it your GraphQL schema. You tell it how to resolve the data in that schema, and it really does the rest. And we as a team like to say that we tolerate GraphQL because AppSync is such a good service. And the way we had it set up is that we had AppSync uh, making, invoking Lambda functions, and those Lambda functions were, were fetching the data from DynamoDB and returning that all the way to the client. 
But we've been reading online about um, these things called direct service integrations. Uh, and that you could replace those DynamoDB data sources with, or those Lambda data sources with DynamoDB data sources, and these things called VTL templates. Um, so we decided to, get, to give that a try. And what actually happened was we were able to build all the, necess all the necessary queries for the customer portal on Stroll without writing any real code at all. Instead, we'd handed that responsibility over to just configuration, and we can instead focus on actually solving the real hard problems that come with building an insurance platform. Truly life-changing stuff. I no longer had a Lambda function with my dodgy code in it that was keeping me awake at night. And really what we came to the realization as a team is that we were actually playing with AWS Lego. And I've lawyer-proofed my slides because there's Lego and AWS employees here today. And really, I think one of the things that helped reinforce this metaphor for us is that we were using the CDK. And if you're not familiar with the CDK, it's an infrastructure as code framework that you can use type safe languages to define your infrastructure and deploy to AWS. And because the compiler is keeping you right, it's really providing that metaphor for AWS Lego. Whenever things fit really well together, it'll be possible. Whenever you start to find some resistance, you sort of need to know that that's probably not the best way of doing things. Our head of learning at Instill said this on a training course that I was on way back at the start of my career with Instill, that being a software engineer is just agreeing to do homework for the rest of your life. And that's really lived rent free in my head ever since. And it's true, really, if you want to encourage a serverless mindset, and you want to enlighten developers that writing less code is better, as a lead engineer and as an architect, you need to do your homework first on the best way of doing things. And whenever you, I believe if you really do your homework, you'll come to the realization that serverless is the best way of doing these things. As engineers, we're told that code is a liability. But let's be honest with ourselves, engineers. Do we actually think that it's their code that's a liability, that my code is perfect? And that's an attitude that you need to set to one side if you truly want to embrace a serverless mindset. I need to make a confession to the room this morning. I'm a huge Apple fanboy. I can't stress this enough. And my dream job is to be an independent iOS developer. And if you're familiar with iOS development, you'll know that the primary language you can use is Swift. And there's a process for the Swift language called Swift Evolution that allows people to suggest lang new language features that go through a whole approval process and eventually be included in Swift. It's essentially an RFC. And there's other languages that have something similar. Kotlin has the same thing. I know other languages do too. But like I said, huge Apple fanboy. So history and facts aren't really that important anymore. It just matters what I tell you right now. And I decided to take inspiration from a swift evolution process and introduced our team the Stroll evolution process. And the idea behind the Stroll evolution process is this. It includes a proposed solution to achieve a goal. It has information about the proposed design, what effects there's going to be on the clients, as well as any alternatives considered. It's always, good to, it's always good when you can answer, but why didn't you do it some other way, at least even for yourself in the future? And that last part sort of leads itself to like an architecture decision record as well. So it's multiple things all rolled into one. And the headings of a stroll evolution look like this. And really what we're trying to do with the stroll evolution process is encourage ownership in our teams and provide a way for engineers to own the end-to-end -end solutions. And through the Stroll Evolution process, we as a team, we modeled our first DynamoDB table um, using the guides in Alex Debris' book. Um, we, uh, a colleague used it to propose our first step function that Julian shared. And not only like, what he's going to actually do in that step function, but the reasons why we as a team thought that step functions were a good idea. We also used it to plan out how we process insurance policy documents, which is a critical part of how Stroll works, and what the best messaging services in AWS were to actually solve that problem. And I think that if we, one of the key things to encouraging this serverless mindset and instilling confidence in your teams is that you first need to build ownership uh, in your team. And what we've seen as a team with encouraging that ownership is we have engineers who have um, come out of school and straight onto this project through our apprentice program, engineers who have come out of university through a conversion course and have no industrial experience at all, and they're taking ownership of the end-to-end -end solutions, and they're doing it using serverless. And we've seen that we have engineers who have taken greater ownership 
than they might have if their architecture had been different. They need to understand the entire end-to-end -end journey, the reasons why we use these services, um, and that, I think, has built a very well-rounded, confident serverless team. Um, but if we want those engineers to own that end-to-end -end solution, uh, one of the things we needed to do was enable production deployments with confidence. And we'd reached a period of time in our team where um, Julian shared the Dora metrics earlier, where our deployment frequency had really dropped quite dramatically. Deployments had been left to senior engineers to actually go and click the button, and that was not something that we as senior engineers had told people to do. It's something that had naturally happened down to fear. People were afraid of breaking something whenever they did a production deployment. And we wanted to get to the stage as a team where we could deploy multiple times a day, any day of the week, whether it be a Friday afternoon or not, and have the confidence that what we were deploying to production was actually going to work. And the reason behind that fear was how we were testing that Stroll was functioning correctly. You might be familiar with, I call it the testing triangle, people call it the testing pyramid. And the idea is that you have a lot of unit tests and because they're cheaper to write and maintain and as you go up the triangle, um, things get cheaper. Um, but on Stroll, our testing triangle looked like this. We had way too many unit tests, no integration tests at all, and some end-to-end -end tests. And I would say that a lot of our unit tests didn't provide any value but our end-to-end -end tests were incredibly valuable. And we wanted a way to, uh, we wanted to figure out a way of introducing um, those in key integration tests to our project. And the reason why we didn't have it is because serverless integration testing is really difficult. There's essentially two ways in which you can solve this problem. The first one being is that you try to simulate the cloud on your developer machine. Um, you can run it all in a Docker container and just hope that that's going to behave in the same way that AWS behaves. I think that's the wrong approach. Amazon and AWS move so quickly that you'll never be able to keep up with those new features that they bring out um, through uh, trying to simulate that on your machine. I think the correct approach is to deploy to the cloud and to test it in the cloud. And we as a team all have our own AWS accounts and we're continually deploying to those accounts to run our integration tests. But if we wanted to put this integration testing process in place, we as a team needed to come up with a definition for what that means for Stroll. And through a Stroll evolution process, we defined it as this. An integration test in this project is defined as one that tests integrations with AWS services. And we mock out any calls to any third-party services. And really what we're testing um, is we're testing that, first of all, that our workloads in the cloud are functioning correctly. Um, and as a side effect, we're testing that all the necessary resources are there and working as you'd expect, and also that everything has the correct permissions to actually do what it needs to do. And we've seen that through in introducing those integration tests, and we've obviously um, added a lot more over time, is that we've seen our deployment frequency and the confidence in those deployments has increased quite dramatically. And we have anybody in the team will now happily deploy to production at any time of the day, and we're very confident that things are going to work as expected. So that was a really quick tour through the Stroll project and how you can encourage the serverless mindset, how you can enlighten developers that writing less code is better, and how you can enable production deployments with confidence. Now, I wouldn't be any kind of an engineer if I didn't provide some kind of data to back this up. So I surveyed the Stroll team. Um, I didn't tell them why I was surveying them. I just surveyed them. This is an anonymous survey. And I asked them when they first started on the Stroll project, how much did you fear serverless? And the, the gauge here is five as being that you feared it a lot, zero is that you didn't fear it very much. So we can see that due to the mixed nature of experience in the team, we had some people who felt fairly confident and some people who were absolutely terrified of the serverless nature. But then I asked them, how much do you enjoy working with serverless specifically on Stroll? And we can see that we got a really good response here from the team that we had a lot of fours and a few fives. The team really enjoys the serverless aspect of Stroll. But this next one, I think, is really interesting. I asked them, how much do you think that serverless has helped your own career? And we can see that we have a very positive response from the team. Um, I think that what that tells us is that those engineers on the Stroll team see that serverless is the future for their careers. They see that the Stroll project has put them in good stead for the years ahead. So it's a really confidence-boosting thing for myself as, as one of the leads of the team that those engineers feel that the project has been beneficial to themselves. This one here, this is the last question. So how likely would you opt for a serverless architecture again? Um, and then the question was, if you're a lead architect, how, would you, how, how likely would it be that you'd opt for serverless again? And again, we can see that with a positive response, quite a lot of fives and two fours. 
and then one absolute traitor who gave me a three. So they will be dealt with Game of Thrones style later on, I can assure you that. Um, so thank you very much for listening to that quick journey through the Stroll Project, and I hope that you can take something away that allows you to instill some confidence in your serverless teams. Thank you.